Hi, I'm Plummy, and in this episode of Plummy's Thoughts On, I'm gonna be sharing my thoughts on the most recent episode of Fear the Walking Dead, episode 9 of the 6th season. Hi, I'm Plummy, and in this episode of Plummy's Thoughts On, I'm gonna be sharing my thoughts on the most recent episode of Fear the Walking Dead, episode 9, Things Left to Do. But the thing is that about this episode, I honestly don't really have too much to say about it. It's not like it's a bad episode or anything. I enjoyed it. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think it's just as good as any other episode that we've had this season. But that is also kind of the point. Because it's pretty much on par with every single episode that we've had so far in this season, I don't really have too much to say about it. Like, it doesn't really stand out that much from the other episodes in terms of anything. It still has a lot of uh, references to the main show and to older seasons of uh, Fear the Walking Dead. It has uh, some really funny lines uh, that are funny in certain contexts and some that are personally funny to me. It has good dialogue throughout it and it has some wonky stuff in it as well but like it's pretty much exactly the same with like every single episode in the season so I don't really feel like I have too much to say about it without reiterating a lot of uh, what I've already said so yeah this review might not end up being as long as my usual one and also I want to apologize for uh, doing this review so late after the episode was released I just really didn't have time uh, to uh, do a review sooner uh, to, the, to when the episode was released because I was busy with personal stuff as I've mentioned in other videos I'm currently uh, uh, studying for a driving t uh, for a driving test. I don't know what you call it in English. I'm basically uh, studying for a driver's license. And uh, a few days ago, it was my uh, uh, theory t part of the test, so I was completely focused on that, and I couldn't really do any videos because, as you can uh, see, I haven't really uploaded anything in like a week. But yeah, now uh, I've passed it, so I'm back to uploading stuff. So yeah. Yeah, I guess let's start off with how the episode opens up, which is, uh, it opens up with June, with the aftermath of what happened in the previous episode, where John sadly died. Um, I personally don't really have a problem with it, I always obviously knew that some people are gonna be triggered about it and want to drop the show, but I personally am fine with that. That's kind of the reason why I watch this show, these shows in the first place, because I want to get invested in characters only for them to die in tragic and heartbreaking ways. Like, am I the only one who watches this show for, for this reason? I don't know. But personally, I love his death. It's beautiful, it's tragic, and it hurts. And I love it. That's why I watch it. But yeah, we actually open up with a really cool scene here in the beginning with uh, one of the first images of the episode being uh, John's dead body in a blurry kind of shot. I think that looked really cool. But uh, what was especially cool to me uh, is a little bit afterwards as June decides to pick up his gun, how f throughout most of that scene we just hear muffled sounds from the background, but the second she picks up the gun and looks at it and contemplates what to do with it, it switches to normal sound. And what is especially cool here is that there isn't even any sad music or anything telling you how to feel about about the scene, it's just background music, which um, is something that I want to uh, talk about for a little bit, where in the last few seasons of The Walking Dead, uh, for season 9 and 10, I've noticed much more uh, music, not even in just background shots and just background moments where nothing is happening, but like even more usage of actual songs throughout the episodes like we had in that episode 17 uh, with the song called You Want It Darker. I think that was a really cool song to end the episode but uh, the early seasons of The Walking Dead actually didn't really have music in a lot of the scenes. It was just background noise of animals making noise like you would hear cockroaches and is, is that what a cockroach is? I'm, 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 I'm not sure, but like you can hear insects and many kind of nature sounds in the background. And that scene in the beginning uh, 
you end up hearing those exact same sounds that you used to hear in the early seasons of The Walking Dead. So that was a nice little callback, whether intentional or unintentional, I don't know. But I liked it because uh, that's one of the things that I liked about the early seasons, that it felt uh, real in that regard. Even though personally I hate season one and I'm gonna at some point in the future talk about why I hate season one when I get to review it. But for now, you just need to know I hate season one, but I still like aspects of it. So the episode already hooked me in with the opening scene. I really liked it. Although that shot with June uh, when she was uh, talking to Virginia, I feel like it m maybe it was just because of the way it was blurred because the background was for some reason very blurry while June in the forefront was crystal clear, but it felt like it was green screen, which wouldn't surprise me if they did that, uh, because this episode was shot during COVID times, about the same time as, I believe, 10C of the main show was shot. And we did have a bunch of green screen shots uh, in that Here's Negan episode, which I actually completely didn't notice when I was uh, watching the episode, and when even when I reviewed the episode. But I saw it when people were reacting to it, so there's that. But yeah, it, it just kind of struck me as like, oh, is that green screen? I still don't know whether it is or it isn't, but it was just a thing that happened, I guess. So yeah, um, if I remember correctly, the following scene is when we go to Virginia's settlement, where she has lined up some of our uh, characters there as a Negan-esque lineup, which, I mean, honestly, I didn't really give a shit about the lineup, I knew that nobody was going to die, even though they were kind of showing uh, in teasers or whatever that there was danger for Daniel, but like I never felt like he was going to die. He barely did anything. If they were going to kill him, they were gonna give him a little bit more story this season. Unless the actor really, really wanted out, which I wouldn't be surprised if he would want to, but hey, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what happens behind the scenes to be honest, I don't know his relationship with the cast crew and crew and writers or whatever, so maybe he doesn't really care too much, even though he has kind of shown that he's uh, not happy with the writing of the last few seasons, although season 6 has been really good, as we all know. Yeah, so the lineup was kind of meh, there was cool dialogue or some funny and interesting dialogue as I've come to expect from this season of here. Uh, like uh, when Sarah says that she's gonna put her foot up Strand's ass, that was kind of funny. I like that. Uh, but there's not too much happening in that scene, so... Uh, Morgan then shows up out of fucking nowhere. I feel like... Even though I don't really think that COVID affected Fear the Walking Dead second half and just the episodes and writing in general as much as it did for season 10 C of The Walking Dead, which was in itself kind of meant to be more experimental to find out exactly what the best way to deal with the pandemic and doing the, these shows is, so cut them some slack, please. I still feel like it affected it a little bit because there are some clunky moments in this episode I feel more than a lot of the other ones that we've had this season because Morgan kind of comes uh, in this episode out of nowhere and in the previous episode uh, he and Dakota were for some reason in trouble and that was kind of confusing because from what I remember where the fuck were they even in episode 7? I don't even remember. They just left... Uh, Dakota, Morgan, Charlie, and Alicia, I believe, all left together. So why the hell did they get separated? I I don't know, that just kind of happened off screen and it's not really explained. And talking about things happening off screen, I feel like this season, as good as it is, still has flaws because a lot of shit happens off screen and that kind of bothers me a little bit. Like. It was cool, like a few episodes ago, I think it was in like episode 2, at the end of the episode we had Morgan and Daniel meet up and shake hands, and I thought it would have been cool if they... I expected that they were gonna show more of Daniel being a spy in the community for Morgan. Instead they kind of just used that as a plot device of like, hey, this is how Morgan gets supplies, and just left it at that, like it wouldn't have been cooler for, Mo for Daniel to... Uh, 
to do something more, to be an actual spy and have an episode focused on him in the first half of the season. Like, I don't want to tell the writers how they should set up their story, but I feel like maybe they shouldn't have had one of the Dwight episodes and gave Daniel an episode, you know? Or maybe you could have had both of them in that same episode, but I guess they couldn't do the cool title card thing that they're doing this season, which admittedly, I think is fucking cool. I love the title card thing. And if there's anybody who wants to do a title card for every single episode of The Walking Dead, that would be fucking amazing because I would love to see that for both, both for Fear, The Walking Dead and World Beyond because it's such a cool idea and they look so cool. I love it. I just love it. That's one of my favorite things and the best things that Fear has done this season. Because they're also kind of switching up the intro team for each episode a little bit. Uh, for those of you who haven't noticed, yes, that is the case. So yeah, um, where were we? Oh yeah, uh, Morgan shows up out of nowhere. He starts to kind of argue over Virginia. Literally, he starts to scream and explain to everybody what exactly happened with Dakota killing uh, that uh, cowboy guy. I believe his name was Cameron. And it was just kind of funny how he was just screaming over her while, while she was not threatening at all and not really able to hold the situation like it was funny how she didn't have even she didn't even have anything to defend herself with he, she was just like oh yeah 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 you're telling the truth yeah they're gonna believe you she's like me when i was like in my early teens and i was bullied in school and i had no way to defend myself beyond just words like whenever my uh, classmates would bully me in some way or they say they're gonna be beat me up or i get i got angered by something and then I say that they'll get they'll get it at some point I'll beat you up when obviously the scrawny guy that I am I wouldn't be able to beat them up it just felt like that and it was kind of funny uh, but just the one little thing that I want to address some people have a problem with Virginia not really being a threatening villain I personally disagree with the idea that your villain needs to be threatening per se I think it's more important your villain to be compelling, not necessarily threatening. Because when you have a threatening villain, I, I feel like it just kind of sets a certain... It sets your characters and villain characters in, it's in a certain box, which you kind of can't really get out of. And it just becomes boring if every single one of your villains is just a little bit more threatening than the last one, you know? I think it's much more interesting when your villains are just different ideas, much more unique in terms of <clears throat> in terms of characters and just concepts in general, compared to just having them be more threatening than the other. Like, yes, the governor and Negan are all iconic characters, but they're not really different from each other. While compared to recent villains from Fear, Yes, Virginia and maybe the the end is the beginning lead the leader of the uh, the group that we're about to meet in the second half of season six of Fear are probably not going to be nowhere near as iconic as Negan and the Governor, but are much more interesting because they have more unique aspects to them, you know. So I personally don't really need a villain to be threatening to me. I just need them to be compelling and for me Virginia is pretty compelling villain and for those people who cannot believe that she is the leader of the community and nobody has decided to impose a coup or whatever the only other threatening guy in the group uh, is the cowboy guy with a smug face that you see usually uh, following Virginia and he clearly has uh, loyalty to her so i don't really need that to be explained although i think that could could be cool to explain to me why is he so loyal to her but that could explain why they are following her because they think that he is threatening or maybe because virginia's communities are not really that bad and she is not really that bad of a leader for the most part uh if you're looking at it from a perspective of a person who has nowhere else to go and 
is able to live relatively freely in those communities in safety and calmness why would you be just poking the bee's nest and attacking virginia trying to overtake her and become a leader when you could just fucking live your life and don't trouble your head with stressful stuff like leading a whole community like is that hard to believe that some people are just gonna follow her because they don't want to be bothered to lead the community like how is that any different from what we have in the real world in our countries like a lot of people do not want to bother with politics so they just vote for people who are willing to do that you know it's the same thing to me at least but yeah i'm getting a little sidetracked so we have that whole scene with morgan arguing over virginia which is funny um, then Strands uh, ends up committing a coup and shoots Virginia, sadly not in the head, but in the shoulder, which I kind of expected. Uh, then there is that one clunky scene where she is supposedly shot and lying on the ground, but then in the next shot she suddenly has grace and uh, holds her at gunpoint. And afterwards there's a scene where she uh, and her... Uh, loyal soldier, let's call him that, uh, grabs uh, Grace and Daniel and puts them in a car and takes them away. And here is something that just bothers me. Okay, so the writers clearly realize that the fans love Daniel. They realize that Daniel is a badass. So why the fuck are they making him out like an old man? Like why? Like Daniel of the first three seasons, what? have not let himself get taken like that. Like, they clearly are writing characters better this season. They clearly understand where the characters are coming from considering the first three seasons. Like, they are acknowledging the first three seasons when it comes to writing the characters this season. So why the fuck are they not doing that with Daniel? Even when they're doing it in, the, in other scenes, it just creates a ton of whiplash because in one scene, he's gonna be acting like a spy badass or whatever. And then in another scene, he's gonna feel like an old man who cannot do shit. He, he, who can barely wipe uh, his own ass, basically. But yeah, that's probably the m major thing that bothered me about this episode, because other than that, I don't think there's anything bad about it. But yeah, in the following scene, uh, obviously, uh, the soldier who is very loyal to Virginia gets Grace and Daniel away. So Virginia now has leverage over Morgan and forces him to save her and get her away because Strand wants to kill her. So they escape and I love that they came back to this location. It's really cool to me. I don't know, it's just kind of cool when shows go back to locations that are kind of become iconic or important for a character or just a sh the show in general. So in the following scene, uh, Virginia wakes up at the water tower place where Morgan used to be staying at the beginning of the season. It's a cool location, as I said, and it's cool because to us it kind of has a little bit of a sentimental value, especially because the first episode of season 6 was such a good episode that nobody expected to be as good as it fucking was. Um, but uh, Morgan and Virginia have a pretty good uh, conversation. I really like the dialogue in that scene. And in the scene, it's revealed that Dakota is Virginia's daughter. Something that, weirdly enough, I don't know, I feel like I kind of already knew that or expected that. It, it's not necessarily predictable because I never really thought of like, oh yeah, that that makes sense, I guess. That could be interesting direction for them to go. But it's just like, oh yeah, okay. So that's that kind of makes more sense, I guess. It, 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 it's kind of how it makes me feel. It makes me feel like I kind of, I already knew that even though we didn't know that. But it's still a cool twist. And the funny thing about this twist is, is that in a way it shouldn't change anything because they were still related to each other before and I don't think it's okay for the show to say that a mother and daughter relationship is more important than a sister relationship so suddenly just because Virginia is Dakota's mom and not her sister 
it excuses everything that Virginia has done to protect Dakota, implying that a sisterly bond is not as important, you know? But on the other hand, even for myself, it kind of makes me feel different about those two characters. It has changed their relationship, even though it, it's not necessarily that big of a change. Like, it, it, in factual terms, it doesn't really change anything. In technical terms, it does. I guess that's the best way to put it. And I kind of feel both for Virginia and Dakota now a little bit. I know that that would be blasphemy because a lot of people just wanted both of them dead because I don't know maybe a lot of people get into watching TV and movies and TV shows in general with the sentiment of if I disagree with it it's bad or if I don't love it then I must hate it where I personally I get into shows and movies wanting to like them I try to like them and if I don't then that's just it, I move on. Because a lot of people hate them and just want them dead, which I also very much disagree with because I look uh, on what, it, what would be right and what would be wrong for the characters from the perspective of the characters. And if I was in this show, if I was a character in the show, I wouldn't be supporting uh, killing Dakota, even though I think what she did was wrong, I think she shouldn't have killed John. I still think it's wrong for a kid to be killed just because they killed somebody else. Uh, I think the context is important, I think it's important to acknowledge that they're a kid and that they shouldn't be serving a death sentence to a kid. Uh, wait, I, I kind of lost my thoughts, sorry. So, um, we have the reveal that Virginia is Dakota's mother. So, then Sherry shows up out of nowhere and wants to kill Virginia. And I don't know how I feel about that. Um, I understand what the writers are trying to do with, uh, with Sherry and her lust for revenge uh, towards Virginia. But it's kind of disconnecting, you know? I understand that they're trying to use Virginia as a stand-in for Negan because she has PTSD and trauma from Negan and she hasn't dealt with it the same way Dwight has and she uses Virginia as a stand-in for Negan but even though I get what they're trying to do it just doesn't really work for me it just feels weird like in one following scene later where they're debating on whether they should kill Virginia or not uh, with Morgan not wanting to kill her and Sherry and Strand wanting to kill her instead of the group that has actually suffered under Virginia's reign which Sherry is part of she works with that group they sent Sherry instead of any of the other guys showing up they sent Sherry the person who has no connection whatsoever to Virginia I don't know, it just feels weird for her to be the one to push for punishment for Virginia. I get what the writers are trying to do, but it just doesn't feel right, you know? But yeah, um, we have a scene with Sherry showing up and wanting to kill Virginia, and we have the one kill uh, for a zombie. In this episode, it was literally the only zombie we saw in this episode, so that was uh, interesting, I guess. It kind of reminds me of season 3. Uh, of fear in a way because in that season season it was barely a zombie show which was actually kind of amazing <laughs> and I feel like The Walking Dead in a way is at its best not only when it like focuses on the fact that it's a zombie apocalypse but a lot of the time when it just completely ignores that and it just uses this world to tell really cool stories but yeah um, here uh, Virginia has uh, a little bit of a funny line that I at, le at least I found funny because she says you're not part of uh, uh, one of my franchise because I find the use of the word franchise weird even though I, I understand exactly what she means by that because Virginia has more than one settlements or communities or whatever you want to call it but it just uh, uh, sounded funny to me because uh, Sherry is a crossover character from The Walking Dead, so I took her saying franchise as if the franchise. So it, it's a dumb reason why I found it funny, but I found it funny nonetheless. And 
Morgan comes out of nowhere and saves Virginia from Sherry. And uh, there's a really kind of a, bad, a subtly badass line uh, by Morgan where uh, Sherry tells him that he's just as bad as Virginia and he, uh, while pointing the axe stick thing uh, towards her, says, what you say to me? It was just like really threatening and really badass for Morgan to say that and I wish they played more into that side of Morgan, which they actually have a pretty decent amount, but yeah, it's just so cool when he's badass like that. I think it's much more entertaining than having him be a very morally white kind of character. Pardon my usage of the word, but like that's the best way to explain it. Like they have him go a little bit uh, backwards towards the all life expression kind of Morgan again, even though that's not what they do. Uh, that's not what they're intending to do in the episode. That's not what they're implying. So. Hold your uh, torches and uh, so hold your torches and pitchforks. They're not reverting Morgan back again. They're not flip flopping again. I'm gonna explain exactly what they meant by what they did with the character in this episode in a little bit. Um, so yeah. I mean, literally the following scene that we have after this scene is an example of the fact that they're not taking Morgan back to the old life is precious route because while they're walking towards Morgan's community, uh, Morgan and Virginia are talking and Morgan says that for all the things that she has done, like uh, John's death, which is in a way uh, Virginia's cause because she has traumatized Dakota so much that she had felt that she had to do that that he is willing to kill her when the time comes. It's just that the time hasn't come yet. Um, and yeah, in the following scene, we get to see how much Morgan's community has actually uh, expanded, which is interesting because I didn't realize how much time has uh, passed. And here we have a, a, a bunch of uh, interesting uh, discussions I guess about exactly what they want to do with Virginia, Strand shows up, Sherry shows up and they both want uh, Virginia to come out and get killed while Morgan wants her to uh, uh, I mean, I mean, at that point, Virginia wants uh, is willing to sacrifice herself uh, as long as the code is allowed to stay in the community, which understandably frustrates our group because after what she did in the last episode, they're not exactly want willing to do that. And I like the aspect of the of, of the following scene where we see the code that she's actually chained up and put into a prison cell essentially for what she did. It's understandable, um, and and it was kind of cool. Um, was it in that scene where they said that? I think it was later, so... Um, I think afterwards they decide uh, that Dakota can stay and they will take out Virginia as long as Morgan is the one to put her down, essentially. Um, so they take her out and Morgan is readying himself to behead her. And this is, by the way, a really well-executed scene, in my opinion outside of the ending of it, which I'm gonna get into in a little bit, where Morgan is preparing to uh, behead her on a rock, and we see a flashbacks to all important moments in this episode, I, I, I mean in this season, uh, which is maybe a little bit on the nose and not exactly subtle, but I think it works, and I just love the way Morgan yells out his lines afterwards, where he's screaming like, the hell are we doing here? Because uh, like, because uh, like this whole season, he's been trying to kill Virginia and save save his friends. But at this point, they've won. They don't really need to kill Virginia. And for those people who think that Morgan is flip flopping with his characters, in this scene here, him his unwillingness to heal uh, to kill Virginia is not because he thinks her life is precious or anything. He just doesn't want to either be an overly moralistic uh, person who is not willing to do the bad deeds that need to be done in this world, while at the same time he doesn't want to become an unnecessarily brutal, murderistic psychopath. 
because it's easy to go either way. And I, I know that fans love when our main characters become uh, rem remorseless killing machines. And yeah, it's kind of cool and exciting. Even I'm guilty of that. But also from a logical standpoint, it's not the right thing. Like, it's cool that in season 6 our group slaughtered Negan's people. It was an awesome episode. But that was super fucking wrong. So, the point that Morgan makes in that scene essentially is that, uh, or at least the writers are trying to imply is that, yes, when you need to kill, you, it's okay for you to kill in this world. They killed a bunch of people in this episode. But when you've already won the battle and you don't need to win, you don't have to be unnecessarily brutal. In the heat of the moment, it's completely okay for you to kill people, but if you have the upper hand, you don't need to. It's much better to put Virginia in a prison and uh, let her live out her sentence uh, thinking about what she has done. The only weird thing about that scene is where Morgan says we should twist the knife because his whole thing about that scene is that he's trying to uh, say that it, that killing Virginia is not the right thing to do but then he says we should twist the knife which kind of confuses me because I don't understand exactly what he means by that uh, because at the best it kind of implies that he wants her to tell Dakota that she is her mother uh, and then kill her, but that's not really what they do because they just take Virginia back. They allow her to tell Dakota uh, that she has she's her mother and they're willing to let her go because they don't want to kill her as a sign for the beginning of this community. He doesn't want blood to be spilled for the birth of the community, which is honestly completely understandable because after all, with all the flip-flops of the character, Morgan is an inherently very morally white character who always is willing to do the right thing unless he has no other choice. Um, and honestly, this uh, here at the end when uh, Virginia talks to Dakota is probably my favorite scene for both characters. Uh, I think both actresses freaking excel in this scene where Virginia struggles with uh, uh, her ability to tell Dakota that she's, she's her mother because after all she uh, lied to her and killed what Dakota thought were her parents aka her actual grandparents. So it's hard for her to tell her that she's her she's actually her mother and understandably that shakes Dakota in a very uh, emotional way honestly that whole scene is super emotional especially when it comes to Dakota because I kind of feel for what uh, her reaction is in that scene she's at first shaken then she kind of I guess you could say maybe goes into a little bit of a suicidal direction because she acts uh, she says uh, that she shouldn't have been born and asks Virginia why the hell did she bring her into this world like those lines really hit me uh, in a way that I did not expect to I feel like at this point in the season Dakota is in a very similar situation to Lydia uh, in the main show was uh, I think last season you could say uh, I don't remember whether she had any lines like that or moments like that this season, but I mean, I guess it makes sense for that to have happened in the first half. I think she maybe had a couple of moments that I really liked in the first half of season 10, but that was a long time ago. That was like, at this point, two years ago, I think. I mean, we're closing on two years for sure. It was in like late 2019, it, it must have been. So yeah, she's definitely up there as a character that I actually really enjoy and I love watching. So I'm curious where they're going to go with her character. I kind of don't want them to go in the same direction with Charlie because fans are going to be pissed about that. And it's just going to feel like a repeat of that whole storyline that we had with Charlie in season four. Uh, but. I kind of also don't want to lose her because I feel like the actress is amazing and the character has a lot of potential but again unless you kill Charlie or 
you either have to kill Charlie or kill Dakota. Um, or maybe have a relationship between two. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not the one writing this show. But there was a subtle hint in like the first... Uh, I think it was episode 2 when they were dealing with the walkers in that uh, place where Virginia had locked them up. So yeah, um, then at the end we have the probably most shocking thing about it, which I actually did not expect that uh, to see that. I thought that maybe June was going to shoot Dakota. That was kind of my expectations about where they're going to go with uh, somebody avenging John's death. My thoughts were that it was either Morgan going to kill either Virginia or Dakota, but I wasn't really leaning too hard into that. Uh, I was thinking maybe Charlie could be killing Dakota because, again, of that one scene in episode 2 of the season. And because they basically are going through the same storyline, so it in a way could be a... Um, what was the word for it? Uh, as a redemption, it could have been a redemption for Charlie for killing Nick. Um, maybe it could have been Alicia because Alicia was the one uh, pushing for Dakota to be brought into the community So in a way it could have been her fault, which they can't play into it uh, in the episode because uh, uh, Alicia tells to Dakota that she uh, Did everything to make uh, to allow for Dakota to stay and that she shouldn't risk risk it by doing anything stupid so they can't play into that where uh, Alicia might feel a little bit guilty or have some just feelings uh, about John's death and her uh, participation in it in a way but obviously the most likely person who was going to kill somebody was obviously gonna be John but I still did not expect for Virginia to be popped for that I thought Dakota was going to die but honestly as I explained earlier I think this is the better way and from even in universe perspective this is the better way and the right way to go about it because Dakota is after all a child she's still a child she's a teenager but she's still a child she's not able to make rational decisions especially in this world and with all the trauma and PTSD that she has from her mom uh, not telling her that she's her mom and killing their parents or what Dakota thought they were it was her parents So I like that June's thought process is the exact same where the reason why Dakota killed John is because of Virginia So she takes out Virginia and doesn't really do anything to Dakota. I think that's the right way uh, To go about it, but I'm curious to see if we're going to see anything like that how is she going what is her relationship to the Cora going to be going forward forward are they going to have any relationship i do uh, i do want to know that i'm pretty excited for that and in general now june who is a character who i personally haven't hated uh as much as the fandom uh overall seems to hate i don't understand why the hate is as big as it is because at worst uh, June for me is just a character that I don't care about, she doesn't infuriate me, she doesn't annoy me, I just don't give a shit about her. But with this episode, I actually kind of like her now, and I love how much she reminds me of comic Andrea from uh, the comic book from the, for the main show. She literally looks exactly like her with the, the, with the hair put down and the hat. She looks exactly like her, so I wouldn't be surprised if they adapt some of uh, aspects of the character or storylines or something from comic Andrea to June on Fear the Walking Dead. Because first of all, it wouldn't be the first time that Fear the Walking Dead has adapted things from the comic book for the main show. Like, for example, in the comic book there's a scene with... Uh, with... Uh, how to explain it? Like... There's a scene in which... There's... There's a... In the comic book, there is a scene in which there's an exchange between Rick and Negan with uh, people that the other has captured from each other's groups. And during the exchange, one of the people that... 
um, uh, was part of Riggs group, uh, was actually dead, but was a walker, so they didn't realize that they were dead, so they end up attacking uh, Rick or something like that. I'm not sure which side was which, but that was basically the idea. And they kind of did that in the season 7 finale, but Fear the Walking Dead did it earlier in season 2 when they were dealing with those pirates that, they, that took over their boat. Uh, and I think it was like Jesse McCartney was the actor for one of those characters, and he was the character who was killed by Chris, I believe. And uh, then Madison took him to the p to the pier with a mask on his head, so it wasn't obvious that he was a walker. So that was basically the, that scene adapted from the comic book, but on Fear the Walking Dead. So that's why they kind of remixed it for the finale of season 7 with Sasha being in a coffin and Negan not knowing that she's wa a walker. And also before uh, I forget, there's that one scene uh, right before the end of the episode between June and the rabbi who had a little bit of a connection to John as we saw in, in John's episode, uh, which was I think episode 4. Um, John apparently left a letter for June to the rabbi. I think I actually remember that, maybe they even show that in that episode. but. Uh, he gives it to June, and it's a re real nice moment that I really like there. But yeah, um, the episode pretty much ends on a cliffhanger, you could say. I kind of felt and expected more to happen in the episode, but I think a lot of, ha of stuff happened. But I just felt a little bit unsatisfied, in a way. I mean, I don't know, this was a weird episode for me. Um, it's not my least favorite episode of the season, or the worst episode for the, of the season, that's, se se uh, that's episode 7 for sure, I hated that episode. Maybe I'll like it better when I rewatch it, but I, I now really don't like it. To me it was really boring. Um, but it's just, it was a very weird uh, episode, it was a weird mishmash of things happening, I don't know really how to put it. It felt weirdly like a finale, but it's nowhere near a finale. There's still plenty of storylines continuing. We still have like seven episodes uh, of the season before we're anywhere near the end. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I feel like in these nine episodes, we kind of had a condensed version of All Out War. Basically, these nine episodes of season six of Fear the Walking Dead were the condensed version of season 8 of the main show because it feels like like it hits a lot of similar beats you know and it just feels like a better version of it in a way but yeah i still enjoyed this episode it's just a little weird and i don't really feel as much weight for this episode as i did for some of the other ones so it was a good episode but it's closer to the average of the season than to the top you know so yeah, um, in terms of the rating, I mean, I don't know, I think it's good, I kind of feel like giving it like a 7.9 out of 10, but I feel like it was higher than that, so I think I'm going to give it an 8.3 out of 10. I think there was enough in it that was really enjoyable and really changing, uh, uh, impactful for, for a decent amount of characters like June, uh, Morgan, Dakota. So I'm curious exactly where they're gonna go with all those stuff. And the next episode, which is supposed to be a Daniel-focused episode, seems to be really fun as well, so I'm really excited for that one. And I'm literally gonna be watching this episode a few hours after I'm done with this review, because it's gonna be up on AMC+, and that's where I'm gonna watch it. So you can definitely expect the review to that episode much sooner than when I did this. But yeah. Um, I think that's pretty much everything I have to say about this episode, so hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you did, uh, leave a like and subscribe, also check out the description to my Twitter if you want to follow me there, and to my Wattpad where I post my stories, because in addition to doing all these videos on my channel, I'm also a writer, and if you want to enjoy my stories, or you simply enjoy my videos, you can head over to Patreon where you can pledge support, and help with the channel going, help support me so I can keep writing the stories you enjoy. But if you don't want to do it, that's completely fine. You can still help me out in other ways, like liking this video, subscribing, and especially sharing this video with somebody who you think might enjoy it. And I think it's pretty much it for this video, so hopefully I'm going to see you in the next one. Bye!